Um, thanks, everyone, for being here. As um, most of you probably know, Sunlight Foundation is one of our members um, here at INN. And um, they've always been a great partner, um, and we've hosted several webinars in the past sharing different projects um, and different tools that Sunlight has worked on. I'm really excited about this one. I think it has some great data for you guys to dig into. Um, and I really hope to see some good stories coming out of this project. So with that, I will just I will turn it over to Bill. And thanks, everyone, for being here. Thank you so much, Denise. And, uh, and to everyone, um, you know, I'm happy to have people jump in and ask questions whenever, so don't be shy. Feel free to uh, demute and ask something or use the chat. Um, um, so my name is Bill Allison. I'm a senior fellow here at Sunlight Foundation. Um, and I wanted to begin by kind of giving you a sense of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, um, we're going to do an overview of the Fixed Fortunes Project, which I've been working on for, it feels like, uh, 20 years, but it's actually only the last two. Um, we're going to take a brief look at the next release that's coming up in a couple of days that would have been today had I not come down with a really nasty case of bronchitis that threw me off by a couple of days. Um, uh, we're going to look at some sunlight tools uh, that have been useful to me in doing this project and are useful for you. And then we're going to just talk about some budget data that's coming up. And, and then finally, we can do a Q&A at, at the end. And uh, um, uh, I can answer any of your questions. So the Fixed Fortunes Project, um, you know, it really began with uh, uh, talking with, you know, thinking about Citizens United. Um, there's, uh, you know, the Supreme Court decision which basically said that, you know, scads and scads of cash coming into independent expenditures would not lead to, you know, the appearance of corruption, and that even if there is this appearance of influence or, ac or of access, you know, there won't be. Uh, people won't give um, give up on democracy. Uh, we wanted to, you know, given the low poll ratings at a lot of our public institutions like Congress and the executive branch, that's usually more reflection you know, of the occupant than the office itself. But, um, you know, we were very interested in taking a look at, um, you know, the big donors, uh, why they give what they give, and try to show what influence buys, um, you know, that, that access and influence and what it gets. And I should point out that, you know, it's not – the entire government that is uh, um, naive about, you know, the role of campaign contributions. Uh, the Justice Department, for example, they describe, uh, they say campaign contributions are given with a generalized expectation of currying favor and benefiting therefrom. And in part one, what we did is uh, we t took a look at uh, six years of data. We started in 19, I'm sorry, in uh, 2007 and ran all the way through 2012. So we had uh, the three years before Citizens United, the three years after Citizens United. The decision, of course, is January of, of 2010. We just had the five-year anniversary. And um, we looked at the traditional players first. You know, we looked at uh, organizations that were big Washington players. They have political action committees. Uh, we, we limit ourselves to for-profit companies because uh, although we will be looking at unions later on and and trade associations, a smaller set. We did 200 corporations, um, uh, largely because there's so much you know, disparity in terms of different types of industries and different types of companies. Um, but uh, and all the companies we look at, they had political action committees for all six years. They had lobbyists for all six years. We took a look at the biggest political spenders. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that was interesting is that in this group, there was not a whole lot of super PAC uh, giving. Um, I think the biggest was uh, Chevron gave $250,000 to the Congressional Leadership Fund at one point. But, you know, we really didn't see, you know, you know, this was not the kinds of companies that, you know, where you have a Sheldon Adelson or a Tom Steyer. Um, and, yes, we found that they do curry favor. Um, you know, the total political spending we came up with was $5.8 billion. Uh, the total amount of money back was $4.3 trillion in contracts, grants. We looked at uh, bailout from the Treasury Department. Um, uh, you know, they, the, the rewards and the relationship between these companies and the federal government is uh, just enormous. Um, you know, they, they give money for a reason, uh, as, the, as the Justice Department suggests. Um, now, I mentioned, you know, Sheldon Adelson. You know, we found that super PAC donors, there's a slightly different dynamic going on. Um, when you think about, you know, companies like, and I'm going to go back to the list, um, you know, I, 
painstakingly pulled out all those logos. I mean, these are companies that, you know, year after year are active on Capitol Hill. They don't go for home runs. They're always chipping away at they want this, they want that, these contracts, those contracts. And, you know, they're very good at playing the Washington influence game, which they do nonstop. I mean, these are the companies that will have townhouses in Washington for fundraising receptions for politicians. Um, you know, they, they maintain this very constant, consistent presence. Uh, when we skip ahead to, to Sheldon Adelson, um, now he was involved very much in the 2008 election, as he was kind of a dark money player even at that point. Uh, there was a nonprofit that he gave money to that tried to run ads against Barack Obama that got uh, hammered by the FEC and Robert Bauer. Um, but, um, you know, but the real reason he started giving money and the reason why he gave so much money in 2012, he said in interviews, was that there was a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act investigation of his com company, and he didn't like the way he was treated by the Justice Department, which was focusing on a whistleblower who had been in his operations in Macau. The suit came to light when uh, this employee filed a, a lawsuit for wrongful termination, I believe, and mentioned the, the uh, you know, um, things that violated the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act that he was asked to do, and that led to the investigation. So, um, uh, and this is sort of what's so different about super PAC donors. On, on June 11, 2011, uh, the, um, you know, the, and remember, you know, Republicans are in charge of the House now. They have a hearing on, uh, on the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And the very first thing that's asked, that they talk about is this was a law passed in 1977. The world has changed. Uh, is it being applied fairly? You know, businessmen are being hurt by this. Um, you know, there was one person on the committee, it was Ben Quayle, uh, who was a one-term um, uh, representative who was basically um, redistricting, um, basically he ended up losing his seat to another Republican. He asked about, you know, investigations going on in Macau, was there something on Macau, and that's obviously touched on Las Vegas Sands uh, and Sheldon Adelson's company. Um, and this is really kind of a change of pace from the normal types of hearings. I mean, here's one that was, you know, uh, less than eight months before, uh, end of November. Uh, they are talking about, this was a Senate hearing, but uh, they're questioning the, how the law is being enforced because there's no criminal penalties. And they're talking about the huge fines, but they say that those just hurt shareholders and you know, to really have this law have teeth, and this was Arlen Specter chaired this, uh, late Arlen Specter chaired this hearing, if this is really going to have teeth, you have to have um, criminal penalties. Otherwise, the perpetrators get away scot-free. The people who do the corrupt acts really don't face any direct penalties. And this is kind of par for the course for, you know, if you go back year after year, and like and I, I did for this story, uh, every single hearing on the foreign, there's, you know, nobody is ever complaining about the law being too tough. When they talk about enforcement, they're asking, is it, um, you know, is it tough enough? Do we need criminal penalties? Did justice miss this? You know, here's this story that came out of there. And, and you know, generally speaking, this act has been, you know, when Congress is looking at this act, they're upset because there's a lot of corruption out there and the act isn't tough enough. Here was a case of a hearing, and it's the only one I could find a record of, where the thrust of the hearing was that, um, you know, that this law, you know, is too hard to understand and needs to be reined in and we're hurting business. So, you know, that's kind of, so that is kind of interesting. So what happens in between, uh, you know, that November 30th and the uh, June 11th, 2011 hearing, um, Sands gets a subpoena on February 9th, the casino, the Sheldon Adelson's casino. Uh, March 1, um, uh, they report this subpoena in an FEC, in a, a filing with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, then the House holds its June 14th uh, hearing. Uh, Sheldon Adelson starts his, his round of 2012 cycle donating in March 2nd. But the real big money comes in a year later in 2012. Now, we just had an analogous situation in this last election cycle, uh, and this guy is not covered by our, um, in our time period because we looked, as I mentioned, 2007 through 2012, although we certainly mentioned this in the story. We just haven't crunched the numbers for, for the 2014 cycle yet. They're not all in, I believe, uh, or they're just, you know, they're coming in now. Uh, but he, uh, you know, he, he basically says that he will raise and or donate $100 million for candidates who are strong on the issue that he cares about, which is climate change. And the Senate held this all-night session on climate change. You may recall this. Um, 
they, uh, you know, I've got the little picture there of Barbara Boxer, and it's at 9.03 p.m., and it was like 16 hours on C-SPAN. Um, and they just talk and talk and talk about, you know, climate change. And basically they are trying to uh, persuade Steyer that, you know, he should support Senate Democrats. And I just thought that this was a fascinating thing to do. And it, and it really kind of shows the difference between how the traditional interests like, you know, the Goldman Sachs and the Boeings and, the, and so on operate and, you know, what happens when you have somebody who can spend $100 million on an election. And uh, this is something else from 2014. There was a, a bill to ban Internet gambling. Uh, the Federal Wire Act used to be uh, interpreted to have a ban on Internet gambling. The Obama administration changed that in 2011. This obviously upset Sheldon Adelson, uh, who, you know, uh, has brick-and-mortar casinos. Uh, so in the Senate, Lindsey Graham introduced a bill called the Restore uh, Restoration of the Federal Wire Act, uh, uh, and Jason Chaffetz uh, from Utah and introduced it in the House. It did have some bipartisan support, but it died in committee after Ron Paul, of all people, made a huge stink about how this was just a payoff to Sheldon Adelson, and suddenly uh, it really sort of raised the temperature, got people upset. Um, and I think I have a slide out where I have order here. This was Sheldon Adelson's giving in 2010, which I just wanted to show uh, that, you know, in 2010 he was not a big, you know, I mean, certainly he's a rich guy and he's giving some money. There's the $30,000 of the party and so on, but really hardly giving anything at all. And I, I, I apologize for the teeny tiny type on that slide, but uh, I was trying to fit everything in. Um, whoops. Um, so I think, did we lose... Yeah, that's, I apologize. We have a couple of slides out of, out of order. Anyway, so um, I say that it's, it's unusual for uh, something like this to happen because, um, um, you know, standalone bills like this with Sheldon Adelson, um, you know, rarely pass, you know, you know, something that's so clearly for one interest. I mean, usually when these things get passed, it's because they've been tacked on to other legislation. Uh, you know, the GOP controls the agenda now. Uh, you can quietly slip it into a bill, um, um, uh, into you know a long, into just some kind of long bill. And uh, Scout, which was supposed to be in the next slide, is a tool that Sunlight makes that can help you keep on top of this stuff. So if somebody brings up, um, you know, again we you know we don't expect uh, this this bill to be brought up in the same fashion. But if somebody attaches, you know, this is basically I'm searching for the language here. Uh, which you can see on the um, uh, right up here. This is actually language from the bill that was uh, that you know, Restoration of America's Wire Act. And um, you, know, you can put something like that in. You can create an alert. And every time that language appears somewhere, and it'll be probably in the context of a bill, you know, people aren't going to say this on the, for the, the Senate or the House, um, Scout will alert you. So if somebody tries to slip it into some long appropriations bill or some kind of must-pass legislation, uh, you will know, and that's probably what will happen this time around um, when they're trying to get that bill, uh, if Republicans try to get that bill enacted for Sheldon Adelson. So that's the plug for the Scout site, uh, which is something that, you know, when, as, a, and as I work on this project, I mean, it's just so great to have, you know, being able to sign up for alerts to keep up with, you know, what's going on with FEC filings and so on. And it's scout.sunlightfoundation.com, and it's definitely worth uh, spending some time with. And I also mentioned, you know, we had that, that slide with the teeny tiny type and Sheldon Adelson's campaign contributions. That comes from Influence Explorer, which is our data depository. All the fixed fortunes data can be found there. Uh, if you look on the left side of the page, uh, I guess because the Influence Explorer guys like me right now, it's on uh, the, the home page. Um, but, you know, you can get all the data and download and uh, set up. Oh, sorry, is there a question? Oh, okay. If you get a data set, the data set I'm going to be talking about a little bit later will be there as well to download. Um, and uh, but we've also got you know Open Secrets and National Institute on Money and State Politics data. We've got contracts and grants, which obviously is one of the things we looked at for this project. Uh, we've got you know a lot of bailout information and other things. So uh, it's a great great um, site to use and familiarize yourself with, and uh, has a lot of different ways that you can use it. And I think on Sunlight Academy we have a whole. Influence Explorer module that shows you how to use that and get the most out of it. Okay, so now on to, that was the, the commercial, and so now on to the, the next part of Fixed Fortunes, 
which again, uh, had I not gotten sick, I probably would be much closer to being ready to release this data. Uh, but, um, uh, and this is sort of budget data, and, you know, and the way that I got interested in this or started tracking this was I did a lot of work on earmarks back in the day, and uh, I'm not sure if folks remember this, but the Bush administration, around the time that the Coburn-Obama bill was passed, this was the bill that created USA Spending, .gov, the site that has all the contract and grant information, loans and so on, and uh, we know it's not perfect, but basically it, it was a lot easier to use than uh, um, the federal procurement data system or, um, you know, the, um, and I'm blanking on the name of the grant site, which it was always like gave me headaches. But anyway, um, um, out of that, at the same time the Bush administration announced that they were going to start bringing some transparency to earmarks, and he had his Office of Management and Budget go agency by agency and collect information on when um, Congress uh, changed, um, you know, appropriation levels, when Congress basically, and, and that's what the, how they defined an, an earmark. And so they built this database. It's still up. You can download the data still. They've got, I think they go all the way through 2011. Um, it does not include the sponsor info. It doesn't tell you, you know, who, what, which member of Congress, you know, asked for a particular earmark. And it also differs from Congress's definition of disclosure. Uh, this was a story we did just after that data was initially released about defense contractors. And this was just a, a slice of the data from the, those authorization bills. But look at who the top recipients of earmarks were from that data in 2005. And you see Boeing at 457 million, Northrop Grumman 232 million. You know, the big defense contractors and hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, if you look at the earmarks that Congress started releasing in 2008, the top recipients were, I mean, among private companies, were getting like 10 million, 5 million, 4 million. And it's because Congress had a very different definition of what an earmark was than the executive branch. Now, one of the reasons why this interests me is I, I you know, mentioned you know, we're doing this fixed fortunes project. Um, now, some of these are really squishy numbers, not the 200 companies, but um, the co those companies won about a trillion dollars of federal contracts over the six years we looked at. And when the government adds up and says how much it awards in contracts, and I don't trust this number any more than I trust that the $1 trillion is accurate to the, to the penny, but they come up with around $3 trillion total of contracts that they award. So basically these 200 companies are getting about a third of the contracts issued according to, you know, government stats, which unfortunately are the best we have. I mean, I know that, that uh, you know, that again, they're, they're squishy, they're not as accurate as we'd like. But that seems to be, you know, a huge percentage that a very small number of companies are getting. Now, there's more reasons why this interests me. If you think about the whole procurement process and you want the government to be going out and getting the best bang for its buck, the United States government is the biggest consumer in the world, bar none. It spends more money on goods and services than any other entity on Earth. Uh, and at one point, sunlight foia'd from Fed BizOps, which is the, uh, you know, the government procurement uh, portal online. Uh, we got, you know, uh, a bunch of data from it. It's still online. You can download it yourself. Uh, I threw it into a little database and started playing around with it. And, you know, there's really only about 30,000 records in there per year of contract, uh, you know, awards. It's both um, solicitations and awards. And, you know, or RFPs, request for proposals and awards. And only 30,000 records per year uh, you know, we all know that there are way more contracts issued than that over the course of the year. I mean, USAspending.gov, even though some of them are task orders, but there are, you know, you know, millions and millions of records for each year. And this kind of made me start wondering, you know, well, how are companies doing business with the government? Um, which, whoops, I skipped one. Um, okay, let me get back. I have an itchy uh, uh, presenter figure. So anyway, some of the spending is baked into the federal budget. In other words, it never goes through a contracting process exactly. I mean, there are contracts issued and everything, but there's no need to have any kind of competitive uh, bidding because it's already in the budget. You know, they're planning on using specific companies. I mean, this is the V-22 Osprey. This is a page from, uh, I believe this is Marine Corps, maybe Navy Aviation book, um, Naval Aviation book, that's what it is, Naval Aircraft. Um, and, you know, it shows you how much they're buying, how much they're buying year by year. I mean, it's really, really kind of messy, teeny tiny type. 
Um, but um, and eventually I'll show you where they, they will tell you, you know, which companies are getting what. And Congress also plays a role in this process. You know, we know that in 2010, uh, or after the 2010 elections, Republicans said that there were not going to be earmarks anymore. But there is something called programmatic requests. And this is a letter from the, uh, the late C.W. Bill Young. The new ones will be going up uh, very soon uh, after the president's budget comes out. But it explains to members how they can make a programmatic request uh, to the Appropriations Committee. And when they do this, they can't specify a company, but they can specify a program. And here is the key language. And it will say, uh, and this is from that same letter that we just saw, please include applicable account and line number in the beginning of the program request des description, i.e. RDTE A line 30. And so, okay, so what is that? What is that RDTE? Well, that's the research and development testing and evaluation budget. And line, you know, A line 30 is a line item in that budget. Well, I'm going to look at defense appropriation or um, uh, defense procurement because that's a little bit more interesting for our purposes. Although the RDT and E is I mean, all of them are really fascinating. Um, but uh, but you know, you find the big money in the procurement ones, and I wanted to start with them. And so these are all programs, and you've got you know the Poseidon, you've got um, the uh, you know a bunch of different aircraft here, and this again. Uh, is from the, the Naval Aircraft Procurement, the same place that V-22 came from. And so let's just take a look at one of them, the E-2D AHE. And this is a page from a budget justification. And you can see you know, what they're spending fiscal year by fiscal year, and they have the out years and so on. Um, and in case that's, you're not clear on what the, the item they're talking about is, it's this airplane, which is made by, as we will see from the budget document, north of Grumman. And so it lists the contractor, the amount of money that they're going to give, you know, what the unit cost is, and so on. I mean, there's a, just a wealth of information there. Unfortunately, all of this information is in these forms that aren't, you know, it's there, some of them are image files, some of them you can search, but, you know, you can't search all of it because some pages are images, some pages are, are text. It's like the most frustrating thing. The only way to really deal with this is to go through it page by page and find the different companies. And these, you know, these budget justification books are, in some cases, thousands of pages long. But it's also interesting to note, here's a page from Northrop Grumman's lobbying disclosure at the same time that that budget document came out. And you can see one of the things they're lobbying on is the E2D aircraft, um, along with a bunch of others. And these are all actually on this lobbying form. These are all federal programs. So if I'm a member of Congress, what I can do is request, if, as long as I know that line item, so this would be, you know, uh, in the, uh, you know, defense procurement, naval aircraft, uh, program 30B, whatever it is, you know, whatever the number is, and I'm giving money to Lockheed Martin, or I'm giving money to Boeing, or I'm giving money to Honeywell, um, you know, it's just amazing. Um, now, if you want to see a programmatic request, unfortunately, uh, Congress doesn't disclose them yet. I mean, I've called around a couple of offices, um, and I'm you know, going to be taking a run at the uh, appropriations again to see if I can uh, get them. And right now, we're not yet in appropriation season. That kicks off when the president puts out his budget. Uh, and then there will be a couple of months for members of Congress to give them. And I'm kind of more interested in the historical ones right now for my project. But for your guys' purposes, you know, going ahead, I mean, this whole budget season is coming up soon. There's going to be billions and billions of dollars that are directed by people in a system very similar to earmarks that people don't actually know about. Um, but to give you an idea of like how much, you know, more, uh, um, you know, you know how this is like so, uh, just an order of magnitude so much huger than earmarks. This is a programmatic request, and this actually comes from Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut. And he's asking for about $777 million for an extra submarine and, uh, you know, for this Virginia-class submarine. And it describes the whole thing. You'll notice that you've got the, uh, the program, the item name, the, uh, you know, the part of the budget it's in. And uh, this was the budget book that came out, you know, after this request. And it says, includes the FY13 proposed congressional ad total $777.7 million. Um, that's pretty good. <clears throat> and that's, you know, a lot bigger than the kinds of earmarks we were seeing before. Now, I, honestly, to tell you the truth, I know that Richard Blumenthal is not alone in requesting this. Uh, there are dear colleague letters that will go out in appropriation season. Right now, we have a source who's feeding us 
House Democratic uh, um, Dear colleague letters, we'll be getting all of those. We've got some likely prospects. We're hoping to get them for the Senate uh, and for the House Republicans and both sides of the Senate. So we'll have these emails that then dear colleague letters will basically be support my programmatic request for another Virginia class submarine. And you may have like 15 members signing on or 20 members signing on. Some of those members will have, um, you know, um, work from the company that, that makes these submarines. And again, I'm just using the submarine as an example. There's tons and tons of other items in these things. But, you know, they'll have general dynamics workers in their district. Others will not. They'll just get, you know, they're just, you know, people who get a lot of campaign contributions from these organizations. Now, one of the things about this, you know, okay, so it's defense mo money and they're, you know, spending it. And, um, uh, you know, there's always procurement. There's always um, spending. You know, does it really have an impact? Well. Uh, you know, right now the uh, the A-10 Warthog is thought of as the best weapon in the U.S. arsenal to go after ISIS, where we're engaged in the Middle East right now. However, uh, this is an old weapon system. We are not making new A-10s. There's no manufacturer that's getting a ton of money out of this. Uh, you know, the only place you find the A-10 Warthog in procurement books right now are the, are the um, is in the you know, the operations and maintenance or modification sections. And that can be, you know, that can run into some money, uh, but, you know, it's nowhere near what you get for building a new aircraft. So as a result, there's not the kind of lobbying you see around the A-10. I mean, where you're going to see lobbying around something like the A-10 is if you have a member that has a military base in his district where they do modifications or support or have based uh, A-10 aircraft and pilots and so on. Uh, but that doesn't carry as much clout as somebody who has, you know, a, a manufacturer that's making, you know, submarines or, you know, the Joint Strike Fighter, uh, which is, you know, has uh, operations in John Boehner's district and operations and, you know, they basically they kind of spread around the country for key members of Congress. Um, but as a result, I mean, one of the consequences of this is that we may not have the readiness um, you know, defense because decisions are being made for things other than, you know, what does the Surprise, but um, but you know, but that's those are the kind some of the st kinds of stories that you can do. Um, so here's what's coming. Um, this is actually a um, uh, you know one of the you know there there is some electronic data from the Defense Department that I've you know, been lucky enough to use, and this kind of forms the backbone of some of the stuff I've been um, you know when I talked about inputting this stuff. Um, and you can see, and this kind of stretches, this is like the tail end of it, but, you know, they have all these different iterations of each spreadsheet, so you can see, like, where the changes were in this in terms of the appropriations amount, um, you know, and, and uh, um, so that's, you know, a good base. Um, I also built a, you know, little interface for myself that, you know, just some bright colors. Um, so that when, when I went through these things and input them, and originally my plan was that I was going to, you know, turn this over to a bunch of interns, but I wanted to do like at least a couple hundred or, you know, at least enough so I felt like I could explain it to somebody and, you know, know what they should be capturing. And, and I just found this like so, um, you know, first really complicated and ugly, and there will be like, you know, when I bring the data out, there will be a lot of explanations of what, you know, is in there. Um, and, you know, and I have spent more time looking at more obscure terminology from procurement than I care to remember. But basically what this will show you is, um, you know, not just, you know, the names of the programs, but the names of the companies that are benefiting. And I can't say this definitely yet because I haven't crunched the numbers yet. But one of the strange things, you know, when I started doing this, and I started with the year, uh, fiscal year 2008, um, it was really, really easy because, um, there weren't that many companies. I mean, it went really fast. And after earmarks disappeared, these books started, there were more and more companies, and more, and more it's gotten more and more tedious to go through it because they're adding in to programs things that normally, you know, you just wouldn't see there. Now, I'll, I'll have, like, exact numbers of, of, of companies, but I think this is the way that, you know, members are being, are able to direct money to companies like they did under the old earmark system, and that's one of the things that, that we'll reveal. And of course, then you can do all the great stuff with uh, the company, the campaign contributions, the lobbying. Um, so, um, so that will be helpful. Um, in doing this, you know, I standardized the company names. I mean, one of the really, really strange things about these books is, is that company names that no longer exist uh, are still in there. I mean, you know that. Um, 
that very bottom image with the, uh, the generator, you know, down here um, uh, with uh, its Fremont company. I mean, they don't even have a logo on the web anymore. I mean, they were acquired by DRS Technologies probably like in the 70s or something. And, uh, um, uh, but, you know, you know, so, but basically what I tried to do is like, you know, standardize the names. You could see like, you know, parent relationships and so on and use uh, uh, the same kind of organization names the Center for Responsive Politics does so that you can um, uh, tie things up. And this obviously was a huge frustration because there's a lot of different, you know, types of names in there. Um, and, and then I mentioned that Fremont thing from the budget justifications, like how hard it is to, to find this stuff. So what I'll be releasing, and I think that's the most useful for everybody, and I'm, I'm putting out the older data too, but I just don't think that that's, you know, I mean, there's a lot of members of Congress that just, you know, that I'm looking at for that series of stories and that research for how the system works that, you know, aren't in office anymore. But, um, you know, but I, I'm bringing it up to date now from 2013 to 2015, which will be uh, useful for you guys. And then fiscal year 2016 comes out on February 2nd is when, it's supposed to be released. I mean, this is actually the page right here that you can see with the data coming soon. So this, that's uh, uh, one of the marine justification books for procurement. So, uh, and realistically, I mean, it, it takes me about two weeks to get through a whole year to, you know, to put everything in. I mean, I'm, I'm getting faster and faster uh, because, you know, it's, it's a lot easier that I don't have to spend all the time, you know, IDing a company name and, and figuring out, like, that Fremont thing just took me forever to figure out who that they actually were. Um, you, know, I, you know, I still encounter some of those. It'll take some time. But, um, but what I'm hoping to do is, like, you know, by the end of February, like February 28th at the latest, to have, like, four years of this data to release. Um, and then, you know, people can look at, you know, I mean, among the many different ways to look at this, you know, this stuff is all over the country. You can look at the stuff in your city, in your, in your town, um, uh, do some great congressional watchdogging, also Defense Department watchdogging, uh, and really sort of dig into this stuff. And, um, uh, you know, and, and when the data comes out, you know, I guess, you know, we'll probably hold another webinar to actually explain what's in it line by line and row by row and column by column so you can really understand what's there. Um, but, uh, but I kind of wanted to introduce you to this because it's coming and uh, it's just, you know, there's just a huge amount of information in this. Um, uh, but, I, you know, but really I think, you know, the, the, the old the earmark system is still there and, uh, and this is a great way to track it. And there's like far more than just, you know, the, the 200 companies I looked at for fixed fortunes. I mean, I thought about just doing you know, only the com companies that I was interested in had already be done by now, but, you know, there's just, there's so many uh, companies that you're just like, you know, Alliant Tech Systems, which makes most of the ammunition for the military, just misses the cutoff. I think they'd be company number 204 or 205, and they're in here so much, you know, and I just decided that I was going to include, uh, you know, basically if there's a company named in these things, you know, I'm sticking them in there, and, uh, um, you know, that they're, you know, and, and, you know, a lot of these are politically active companies that have lobbyists and make campaign contributions and are just worth looking at. And that is the end of my spiel for today. And uh, so I'm happy to answer any questions or, um, uh, or you know, I kind of went through things quickly. Uh, so please, um, you know, don't hesitate to ask. And you can unmute your phone by hitting uh, star six. And you can, or you can just chat us the question on the left-hand side of your screen. And one thing I should point out, you know, that, that um, you know, there's <clears throat> huge other areas of the budget that, you know, are worth looking at as well. Um, uh, I mentioned RDT and E. I mean, you know, there's all kinds of these different sort of, you know, uh, centers that are getting funded, like these tech centers where you'll have, like, Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman being joint partners and, um, you know, it's basically the government giving them money to do research. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things like that that are worth looking at. And, you know, at some point we'll, we might take a run at those, probably not in as the depth or the number of years that we looked at with these. But um, uh, it's definitely, uh, you know, there's an awful lot of material out there that's worth investigating. Any questions? I cannot have been so thorough that nobody's <laughs> nobody's unsure of something.
Uh, maybe Billy can talk a little bit about like any traction or any feedback from when you did the story. From the uh, the original um, the one, um, yeah, there's you know, um, so um, I think like you know the sort of the interesting interesting thing is that you know. Um, you know, the original story was just kind of brute force. Let's look at some numbers and let's, you know, let's just kind of plow through this. And uh, there's been a lot of interest, though, in, you know, you know, digging into individual companies and I had some conversations with folks about, you know, looking at things. You know, we're taking a look, a closer look at some of them ourselves. We've got a piece coming up on Comcast and sort of how they operate and some of their use of influence. And, and uh, you know, but, what, you know, one of the, the tough things about a project like this is, is that, you know, it, it's uh, you almost have to be an expert on the banking industry to look at the, you know how the banks function. You almost have to be an expert on defense. You know, I kind of feel more comfortable in the defense milieu because you know we did a project at the Center for Public Integrity called um, "Making a Killing: The Business of War." We did defense, you know, outsourcing the Pentagon. We did like a, a whole series of stuff on Pentagon stuff, and it's like you know I've been following you know this and, and also congressional earmarks, so I feel like pretty confident about that. Um, um, the other things that we've been uh, hearing, you know, there was just, uh, um, you know, we've, we've done uh, some pieces, you know, looking at Citizens United itself. And, you know, and I think that, you know, one of the things we're hearing is that, you know, people realizing just how broken our campaign finance system is and, um, you know, that, um, you know, one of the reforms, you know, if you look at um, the regulations that we have now or the laws that we have now, uh, contractors, uh, federal contractors, are barred from giving money to uh, campaigns. Uh, now, what that means is that if I'm an individual and I have a contract with the government for, say, you know, um, you know, one day a week, I train, you know, uh, uh, Peace Corps workers in the language that they're going to be speaking when they go abroad, and I have a government contract to do that, I can't make a campaign contribution to a member of Congress's campaign committee. If I'm Lockheed Martin, which has tons and tons of contributions, and I'm a, one of their top executives, I, you know, I don't have a contract myself, so I can make contributions. Or if I'm Lockheed Martin's PAC, which is controlled by the corporation, but it's a different entity, it doesn't have government contracts itself, they can make contributions. So I think there's, there's you know, the thought that maybe there are ways to start reforming the system that, um, you know, uh, aren't on anybody's radar screen right now, but should be. Uh, you know, I, I'm not uh, optimistic that Congress will act, but I think that there is, you know, different ways of approaching this that haven't been looked at as closely. I mean, I think there's a lot of emphasis on something that I, as a journalist, am incredibly uncomfortable with, which is the idea of amending or changing the First Amendment, um, which I, you know, would hate to see happen. I'd much rather, um, you know, get back to the hard money system and take a look at that. Um, I think that that's, you know, uh, a good area to start reform because, you know, really it's, you know, these interests are, you know, capturing just a huge amount of, of uh, you know, the attention of Congress and the government and, uh, you know, it's, and it was just cited in the New York Times the other day, you know, our findings and uh, in a piece about, you know, the influence of money on politics um, in a letter to the editor. So, um, you know, I think it's having like a little bit of resonance. Any other questions? So, folks, please feel free to email me. My email is right there, and I will keep you, you up to date. And when I'm ready to release data, and I can even send you like some sample data now uh, that you can take a look at if you send me an email, and um, uh, you can start, you know, playing around with it and looking at it. And uh, and I'm happy to talk about what's there and what everything means. Yep, and uh, we have been recording this uh, this session, so we'll make sure once we have it online, we'll send it out to everyone who attended and, and the folks who registered and weren't able to make it. So you can, uh, if there's anything you missed, you can refer back to this uh, webinar. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today, and thanks again uh, for uh, INN and Denise um, for partnering with us to make this happen. And we just uh, wish you a great day, and we'll catch you on the next webinar. Thanks so much.